Why did 50 Catholic priests leave the Catholic priesthood and the Church of Rome? That is a big question and uh, the answer to it is in the book that I published called Far From Rome, Near to God, The Testimonies of 50 converted Catholic priests and welcome to the program it is a great joy to have you viewing and uh, we welcome you because this is sharing together on a, a very important question that I have posed before you. Why did these 50 priests including myself leave the Catholic priesthood and the Church of Rome? The answer is in the book that I spoke about. The answer is given and we've got to see there's a, a thread running through the book. First of all, the thread why uh, the 50 of us wanted to be priests in the first place. We were devout Catholics and we wanted to be pure and holy and we wanted to, to be able to do good things for God and the Church so we decided we would become priests because we were told as priests we would have the authority of Christ himself and we would be able to hear people's confessions, we would be able even to bring Christ down on the altar in the Mass and we would be able to anoint the sick when they were dying so that they could go to purgatory and later to heaven or maybe even directly to heaven so we said so there were these sacraments and they were very important to us and we wanted to be able to do the sacraments so that stage by stage people could come to God we thought through the sacraments and the sacraments were a very big part of our life and the uh, there were quite a few of us who in the 70s, uh, not all the um, testimonies are that recent, but in the 70s, quite a few of us in the 70s who were shocked <laughs> in our priesthood. And it was, it was by reading a Catholic book. I put a picture of the cover of the book on your screen because it is, it was really a shock to us because the author was a white well-known Catholic author who had written many books about Catholicism. Uh, his name was Raymond E. Brown and in this book on the priesthood he wrote the following quotation when we move from the Old Testament to the New Testament, it is striking that while there were pagan priests and Jewish priests on the scene, no individual Christian is ever specifically identified as a priest. The epistle to the Hebrews, speaking of the high priesthood of Jesus by comparing his death and entry into heaven with the actions of the Jewish high priest who went into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle once a year with a blood offering for himself and the sins of his people. And he gives the quotation from Hebrews 9 where this is found from verse 6 to 7. But it is noteworthy Brown goes on to say that the author of Hebrews does not associate the priesthood of Jesus with the Eucharist or the Last Supper. In fact, the once for all atmosphere that surrounds the priesthood of Jesus in Hebrews chapter 10 verses 12 to 14 has been offered as an explanation why there are no Christian priests in the New Testament period. Here this well-known Catholic author tells us priests that in the New Testament there are no Christian priests. So where is our office of the priesthood? We began to we began to doubt whether we were priests, whether there was such a thing as a priesthood, because it's not in the it's not in the New Testament. Now Brown goes on later on to argue for the priesthood from tradition. Now 
as priests we didn't study the Bible as such, we studied philosophy and theology and all sorts of psychology and all sorts of things, but we didn't study the Bible as such, but we at least knew parts of the New Testament and we knew that Christ despised the, <laughs> the Pharisees because they liked to base things on tradition and not on the Bible alone. So uh, Brown's arguments from tradition that there was a priesthood in the early times didn't carry any any water as it were for us. It didn't it didn't ring true. So we began quite a few of us to have doubts about our priesthood and indeed when we did take up our Bibles and begin to study we, we had every reason because uh, in the book of Hebrews says clearly that there were Old Testament priests but no New Testament priests and gives a reason why in Hebrews 7 verse 23 to 25 I quote exactly what the scripture says and they truly were many priests because they were not uh, suffered to continue by reason of death but this man Jesus Christ because he continues forever has a non-changeable priesthood Christ has an unchangeable priesthood. It's interesting, I had studied Greek and uh, I knew that the word for unchangeable in Greek was aparabatos, not transferable, it strictly means. It wasn't, it wasn't to be given to anybody else, not transferable, that's what the Greek word means, unchangeable. And well it may be, who, who was fit to to fit the qualifications as it says in Hebrews 7.26 the qualifications of Christ who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. <laughs> who can fit that description? Nobody, only Christ alone. So we started to have doubts and that was quite a few of us and when you read the testimonies that was in the 70s so it was uh, it was a shock to us and we began to see as we started to read and begin to read the Bible we began to see it's not tradition it's scripture alone as Christ said in John's Gospel chapter 17 verse 17 thy word is truth God's word is truth. Paul said not to think beyond what is written and Jesus said that the, the scriptures cannot be broken, they cannot be changed in John 35. So it is, it is important and we began to see its scripture and we began reading scripture and we'll see then this was how we were going to come out of the priesthood because now we were going to be set free by the truth. Christ said, if you know the truth, the truth shall set you free. And indeed, many of us in studying the scripture began to, began to be set free. And there were other things that set us free, and you'll see that in my own testimony and the other testimonies of some of the priests. We had baptized babies. I had started baptizing babies and 1964 when I first started to, in the priesthood ministering uh, Baptist on about 30 babies every first Sunday of the month and uh, we saw these babies grow up when the 10 12 years afterwards and they were as wicked as as the other <laughs> other children in the community and where I was ministering in Trinidad West Indies they were as wicked as the, as the Hindu children and the Hindu children were quite wicked. <laughs> uh, they were no closer to God after having baptized them, they were just as equally you know depraved young people and then later on when they began into their teens and they got into drugs and pornography and everything, uh, those that I had baptized were equally into these things as were ordinary kids in society. It doesn't work. I got really frightened too where I had heard a man's confession when he was dying, his wife had called me and then I, I heard his confession, I gave him communion and I, 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 then I anointed him with oil so he could go to heaven immediately after he died and you know and 
I did all the Kathka rituals for him. I was shocked when that man actually was dying. He was in tremendous pain. He was dying from severe cancer. He started to curse God. I went home that night to my presbytery where I was shocked. Here I did all the sacraments for this man and he dies cursing God. Do the sacraments really work? It, it, it was frightening. So there was, it was the scripture and then for many of us it was experience. Here we are ministering sacraments and uh, they don't work. And it was, it was frightening. The words of scripture were emphatic to us and we saw, like it says, Jesus says, it's the spirit that quickens the flesh, prophets, nothing. The words I speak to you, they're spirit and life. It's the spirit that gives life. It's not physical sacraments or rituals of any church. And the words in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Now that was frightening to us because we had memorized as devout priests, we had memorized what the church said the sacraments were from a quite well-known canon going back to the Council of Trent, the, the quite well-known Council of Trent in the Catholic Church. Our sacraments were defined as works by the Council of Trent. I'd like to give you the quotation from the Council of Trent. It's canon number eight quotation. If anyone says that by the sacraments of the new law grace is not conferred ex opere operato from the work worked, but that faith alone in the divine promise is sufficient to obtain grace, let him be anathema. That is eternally cursed. The Catholic Church cursed anybody who said that who, who, um, who would you know, who would not affirm um, but said that grace is not conferred from the work worked. You wouldn't agree with that, uh, but, and you insisted on faith alone. You are cursed by the Church of Rome. These words on your screen, because they're shocking words, that any church could curse anybody who believed what is scriptural that it's the grace of God alone that saves destitute sinners like you and I. We're all destitute sinners before a holy God. And so we began to see, it, yes, it is by grace alone. And we began to see that Christ Jesus said it all, thy word is truth, scripture cannot be broken, the words of the Lord. I'd like to go into individual testimonies and the first testimony is dear to my heart. Well did I know Bob Bush. Bob Bush from San Jose in California and I was living first of all in Atlanta and then uh, where I met Bob first of all and then living in near Austin, Texas. But Bob Bush was dear to me. He had been a Jesuit. He had been even to India. He met another former priest, Victor Alfonso, in India. And it was in India that they really began studying the scripture. And Bob came to biblical faith, having been a Jesuit. He was a Jesuit for, um, I think, equal number of years as I was. It was 21 or 22 years a Jesuit, just like I was a Dominican. And I'd like to read Bob's own word, the very first testimony in the book. He said, the Catholic Church says, in order to be saved, you must keep its laws, rules and regulations. If these laws are violated, for example, attendance at Mass every Sunday, you commit a mortal sin. The Catholic Church says in canon law of the present day, you commit a serious sin that the sin must be forgiven by going to confession to a priest. And it says in Canon 9609, uh, 9, 
quotation, individual and interval confession and absolution constitute the only ordinary way by which the faithful person who is aware of serious sin can be reconciled with God. And then Bob Bush goes on to explain, quotation, the Bible says if we repent in our hearts and believe on his finished work that we are saved. We are saved by grace, not by our works. The Catholic Church adds works. If you have to do these specific things in order to be saved, whereby Scripture says it is not of works lest anyone should boast. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 9. And so Bob Bush saw this. And Bob Bush got free from rituals and Romanism and he came to biblical faith. Is that not a challenge to you? If all your tradition has been in the Catholic Church, should that not ring in your heart? Should you not cry out to God that he would send the Holy Spirit, that you could see as Bob Bush saw, that it is not of works, it is the grace of God, and that you in turn, by the grace of God, could come to biblical salvation with the joy and with the assurance that Bob had. I remember right up to when he died, I think it was about three years ago, he died in difficult times, having become paralyzed, a very serious accident went wrong when he had trouble on his back spine. But he was a man of deep faith, even in the testing that the Lord put him through in the last years of his life. I now come to a very interesting <laughs> character, uh, it's testimony number three in the book. We were talking about Bob Bush in San Jose, California, and now we're talking about Cuthbert Diswingari in, in, in Zimbabwe. So that's a long way away from Zimbabwe, from what had been Rhodesia. Uh, is where Cuthbert, and um, I have known Cuthbert for years, he's the third testimony, and he tells you how he became Catholic in Zimbabwe. Quotation, my family was not Catholic when I was born in late 1965. We moved uh, uh, to a home on a farm near Gomire Mission in Zimbabwe. I am the fourth in the family of four boys and two girls. As soon as we moved to the farm, I was baptized Cuthbert and my family became Catholics. This was a requirement to settle at the mission and to be employed by the church. So the church insisted that um, this family become Catholic so that they could have this farm. Uh, Cuthbert goes on to explain, as I got older I wanted to become a priest. I ended up joining the regular congregation to be a regular clergy. Not long after my final profession, I began to see some of the ugly realities of the church and myself. Little by little, I discovered how difficult it was to keep the evangelical councils, especially chastity. I learned that some of my seniors bought houses in the names of their relatives and even in the names of their children. How was it possible that celibates had children? <laughs> he was asking this question, how could these priests have children if they're celibate? So I decided to ask for advice outside the Catholic Church. That's um, Cuthbert's words. I found an article that, quotation, exposed the falsehoods of the Catholic teaching. Finally, I understood that Jesus Christ completely fulfilled the law. He fully paid my sin debt. It was not credited with it was not credited with this payment from me, but it was by Christ's righteousness alone, his all-sufficient death on the cross, burial and resurrection. This is also true for every genuine believer, because the righteousness of God is imputed to everyone who believes in the present work of his Son on the cross. 
And then he goes on to quote, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Romans 10, 4. Um, that is the heart of the gospel that Cuthbert has come to. It's, it's interesting, I keep in contact with, uh, with, uh, with Cuthbert in Zimbabwe, it's usually done by texting. I'm not good at texting, but he texts somebody else and then the person gives me what Cuthbert says and we, uh, I give something back to text him back. Uh, it's, it's all done. Uh, through mobile cell phones and uh, I keep in contact with Cuthbert. Cuthbert goes province to province witnessing not just to Catholics but to uh, evangelicals, the so-called evangelicals and to pagans there in Zimbabwe. He goes witnessing and praise God that by grace souls are saved in Zimbabwe even under what looks like the end of the reign of Mugabe, uh, but it's uh, the reign of Christ, sovereign grace. is wonderful to see this and to see the Lord used such as Cuthbert Disfingari there in um, Zimbabwe. We move now from uh, Zimbabwe back now to the United States to Sandy Carson. Sandy Carson is dear to my heart. He was the first Catholic priest that I met and uh, came in contact to. After I had left the priesthood and came to the United States, Sandy Carson was a joy to my heart and I was uh, amazed by Sandy because he was saved of all places in a confession box, not by, not by anything sacramental, but by the grace of God convicting him in a confession box. Let me read, let me read, let me read Sandy's own words. Then this is testimony number eight in the book. Quotation, from childhood to the age of 44, 17 years as a Roman priest, the Roman Church had been the pillar of truth for me, my infallible guide to God. The pillar of truth was not constructed solely on the infallible scriptures, but constructed on man's traditions apart from scripture, which were held to be the revelations from God. And then he goes on to explain, quotation, One night I knelt in a confession booth and confessed every sin of my life that I could bring to mind. At the confession, I always confess my sins to God first, though it was in the presence of a priest who would give absolution. As it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. After I expressed my repentance and while the priest was giving the ritual absolution, I cried out to God with my heart, saying, God, if you will forgive all my sins, I take you as Lord of my heart and I will serve you the rest of my life. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then he finishes with the words, leaving that confession box and walking away across the transept of the church, I felt a great peace. And Abba Father rang in my heart. I knew that I had a relationship with God. <laughs> Sandy Carson <laughs> saved it coming out of a confession box, but by the grace of God, no ritual of any man. <laughs> Amazing. And Sandy was, as I say, he was the first other former priest that I met when I came to the United States. And 1986. It was um, soon in 86, going into 87, that I got in contact with Sandy Carson, a dear, dear brother in the Lord. And if you go on our webpage and you can hear me uh, talk to Sandy about his uh, experiences, and it's uh, interesting to hear his own voice, and uh, you can fi feel the warmth and his love for Jesus Christ and his appreciation of what it was to come out of ritualism into biblical faith. 
an amazing challenge to any man or woman who's based in tradition to see the glory of God's grace. So read that whole that whole testimony number eight in, in the book Far From Rome Near to God. And then we come to another very interesting um, former priest. Now we go from the States to Michigan, uh, 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 Mexico. Um, it's a, it's a, how am I, I can, can't pronounce the Spanish name, uh, Mio Ochkan, uh, Mexico. It's uh, anyway testimony number 12. You will see the um, exact word, Spanish word there, where Cipriano Valdez Jaimes uh, came from. And Cipriano Valdez Jaimes is one of these priests and a most interesting character. Let me read his own words. He says, You and I have no doubt have seen one time or another a man dressed as a priest walking with a serene expression on his face. Our first thought may have been that looking, we are looking at a, a god dressed like a man. Actually, it was a Roman Catholic priest a figure shrouded in mystery. That was more in the old days when the Catholic priests wore uh, black and they had Roman colours. It's not true nowadays, but in the time when Cipriano was, uh, and, and certainly in Mexico, was more traditional than the United States where the priests gave off wearing credi uh, cl clerical clothes. And then he says, quotation, I, Cipriano Valdez Hamis, was one of these priests born in uh, Mexico to a devout Catholic family. I received my primary education under the watchful eye of those who taught me to go to confession frequently and daily communion. When I reached the age of 12, I requested the office of the priesthood. For three years, my mind was filled with philosophy of Greek writers. With great care, I was given four years theology, and I learned all the dogmas of Romanism. Finally, I was ordained a priest. So it was that I was told that I had power to forgive sins uh, of my fellow men. I accepted the fact with all my heart. What I did not realize is that forgiving of sins is a divine attribute. It cannot be delegated to man. The scripture says, I, even I, am he that blots out thy transgressions for my own namesake. Uh, it is the work of God not to remember sins. That is Isaiah 43, verse 25. For 20 years in the Roman Catholic uh, priesthood, I perform ridiculous, shameful, anti-scriptural practice of daily listening to the sins of societies, including military men, professionals, and politicians. I celebrated mass and baptized babies. In spite of this, the God's voice interrupted me. God's irresistible voice would not leave me alone. I did. I don't know what I'll do or where I'll go. I know that I have to leave the Roman priesthood. I was expelled from the Roman church because the Lord called me. <laughs> In Spanish, me llamo el Señor. And uh, he wrote the testimony originally in Spanish. The Lord called me. A dynamic testimony. He wasn't looking to be saved, but the Lord called him. And uh, maybe you might dare to pray that the Lord would call you, because it's all of grace. Pray that the Lord would show you that you have a sin nature like all of us, and personal sins. Pray that he would call you. And so that Cipriano's testimony could become your testimony, and it would be lovely to hear from you and to hear how the Lord has saved you. That is one of the joys of my heart in making videos like this, is to hear from people how the Lord has moved in their heart. And it would be lovely to hear from you. And it's very easy to contact us. And uh, you can see on our website where to 
where to email and how to contact us and it is it would just be lovely to hear how the Lord has called you a humble and contrite heart he will not despise the scripture says and so we moved from Mexico now to Victor Alfonso who is testimony 14 in the book <laughs> and uh, Victor Alfonso was in India um, an amazing man who, again whom I have met personally an amazing man and he uh, he gives an account of how he became a Jesuit priest. Uh, let me read from his testimony number 14 in the book. At the age of 23 I joined the Society of Jesus, a missionary order with spiritual exercises. I desired to serve Jesus at any cost and lead all men to know him, his peace and his justice. In the early 60s and 70s I was studying abroad. I lived in the Philippines and in many uh, countries of Europe and later in the United States of America. I witnessed the emptying out of Roman Catholic churches in Europe. For example, in Spain, only 6% attended Sunday Mass. Later in Los Angeles, United States, I saw the double standard lives of those who were called Sunday Catholics, including myself and other priests and nuns. Let me read it as he said it. Later in Los Angeles, USA, I saw the double standard lives of Sunday Catholics, including myself and other priests and nuns. I questioned my Christianity and wondered if Jesus Christ and the Bible were not mere fables for which I was giving up my life in vain. My vision when I joined was to know Jesus intimately and I wanted to bring India to Christ. I was already 17 years a Jesuit in my late 30s, equipped with several university degrees. And uh, it was then that, he says, I considered leaving the powerless, unexciting priesthood. Unknown to me, some Christians were praying for me to be delivered from deception. They prayed and I received the grace to come to the point of confusion and desperation regarding my faith and vocation and to cry out to the Lord, O oh God, show me if you are true, if Jesus Christ is your Son and if the Bible is your true word. In 1972, precisely on Pentecost Sunday, the Lord dramatically saved me. I now know the big difference between experiencing Jesus as my personal saviour after being born again and knowing him as a Roman Catholic. Words cannot describe this wonderful experience of having Jesus as my saviour. Victor Alfonso says that words cannot describe. That is my story, that is a testimony of the priests in the book. Words cannot describe it because it's the grace of God, it's God's word. We attempt to describe it as we do and the other 49 in the book attempt to describe it but how can we explain the grace of God? And that transforms our lives and pray that you would know that transformation as you look to the Holy Spirit to convict you that you're a sinner needing God's grace and then you yourself experience the salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and in Christ alone. We now come to testimony number 26, and this is a, a quite interesting testimony. Uh, Robert Champagne, uh, whom I knew again personally, but he was very low to give me his testimony. He. Uh, he thought it was so much the grace of God that he, uh, <laughs> he, he didn't want to share it. He said that, that this is only the grace of God. And 
I, I, I can't see how I could share it with others. I, I, I pleaded for some years with, with Robert Champagne that he would uh, give me his testimony so that I could put it in the book which I was going to publish at that time. It was back in 1994 and finally he did give me his testimony. And he says in the testimony, quotation, at the age of five I dreamed of becoming a Roman Catholic priest. Also at the age of five, the Roman Catholic Church had thought that my original sin had been washed away by the sacrament of water and baptism, which I was told made me a child of God and incorporated me into the Roman Catholic Church. I was ordained a Roman Catholic priest in the Diocese of Manchester on May the 17th, 1969. After being ordained, I celebrated my first Mass as another Christ and hundreds of more during the few years that followed. I was ignorant of the fact that Mass was such an offence to the Lord. The Bible clearly states that salvation was Christ's work and His alone. When He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the Majesty and High. Hebrews 1.3. In retrospect, I realized that it would have been utterly impossible for me to come to Christ by my own strength, which did not exist, or my own will, because of the sin of Adam in my heart was an enemy. My heart was an enemy to God. I was desperately lost and alienated from God until the Good Shepherd found me and pulled me out of the pit of my sin, causing me to repent and believe. And then he goes on to address you in his book, in the testimony in the book. He said, Dear friend, I would like to assure you that it is not my desire to put down anyone involved in Roman Catholicism. I have no resentment in my heart towards them. How could I when the Lord Jesus Christ was so merciful to, towards a sinner like me? I am giving my testimony with the earnest hope that many may come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour and the power of the resurrection. As the Apostle Paul expressed it, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of suffering being made conformable unto his death. Philippians 3.10 Call upon him now, trust him, he died as a ransom, a substitute for the ungodly. Those were words close to Robert Champagne's heart. Cry out to him now, trust him, he died as a ransom, a substitute for the ungodly. Can you see yourself as ungodly? On the night of my own conversion, going back to 1985, I prayed to God to show me that I was ungodly and he showed me that I was dead in trespasses and sins. If you can dare to pray that prayer, God will answer you. And it's only when you see your condition that you are dead in trespasses and sins that you can understand and receive by God's grace, His grace, to accept you in the righteousness of Christ and to credit to your account Christ's righteousness. And all praise and glory be to Him. So these are just some examples and quite interesting examples. Each testimony is, is, is powerful and so I'm not urging you just to read these testimonies that I've quoted from, but all the testimonies. Each is a, a story in itself but comes back to the same biblical principles. And what was it that we were learning? And it, I think the scripture says it all. The scripture says it, and I quote from scripture, says, That which comes out of the man that defiles a man, for within the heart of man proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these things come from within and defile a man. They were the Lord's own words. 
And then it says in the Old Testament, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? This is true for you and I, and not just a priest looking at this Catholic priest or an evangelical who doesn't know the doctrines of grace looking at this program. It's true for everyone. The heart is wicked and deceitful. And we are full of pride and vain glory. Pray to God to show you that nothing can come of this vain glory. It's to be convicted that you're a sinner, destitute before God, crying out to him for his grace. And he is faithful and true. And he will bring you to that salvation, which is his finished work. Indeed, we have the illustrations of the testimonies in this book, that it is all of God's grace. And each of us in the book came to the state where we saw that we were destitute and we needed the grace of God. What happened to each of us? And it was, it is summarized in a, a wonderful Bible verse and we'll put the verse on your screen there as you watch. It is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 1 and 2. This is true for each one of us in the book. And for you who are saved by God's grace, you know it is true for your own life, those of you who are saved and watching this program. Second Corinthians 4 verses 1 and 2. Therefore we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness or handling the word of God deceitfully, but by the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. We are not walking craftily, doing rituals, deceitfully holding tradition to be equal to the written word of God. No, we are commending ourselves to every man's conscience by grace alone and on the truth of Scripture alone. That is a, just a wonderful Bible verse and it summarizes all the conclusion for each of us who were the 50 former priests in the book Far From Rome, Near to God. Christ's priesthood is like unto himself. He is all glorious, majestic, full of grace and truth. He declared on the cross it is finished. He had completed the work of redemption. It was perfect. He was the one who knew righteousness and fulfilled all righteousness. He is now seated at the throne of the majesty on high, just as he was on Pentecost Sunday. He has received the promised Holy Spirit. So whoever knows they're a sinner and looks to him, he gives grace so that he can reign in righteousness. And those wonderful words from the end of Romans 5, where sin has reigned through death, much more might grace reign through righteousness unto everlasting life. Those words give me such a joy that where sin reigns unto death, much more might grace reign through righteousness unto everlasting life. I dare you read those words, not only to read them, but cry out that they will be true for you. Where sin reigns unto death in your life, much more my grace reign through righteousness. And that is the righteousness of Christ, and what a joy it is. And I say it's a joy to me when I hear from people like yourself who've listened to programs like this. It's such a joy to hear how God's grace has worked not just in the past but at the present day and it's it's a joy to me and the the technicians who help make this program uh, it's always a joy to share how those have been touched by a video such as this because the grace of God we're looking to and he he is the one who gives he is the one who gives grace and so, look at the scripture. 
what did Paul say and it's it's right there in chapter 3 of, of Romans he talked about something being manifest something was obvious but now the righteousness of God is manifest being witnessed by the law and the prophets the finished work of salvation was manifest what Christ had done Paul says is manifest it's obvious is the testimony was given by the law and the prophets before Christ ever came and he goes on for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus we are all who are destitute fallen short of the glory of God justified freely those precious words it's free it's God's gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus by Christ's payment what what can be more glorious when he paid everything down to the last drop of his blood and his agony from his father when he was separated experiencing like a million hells in place of the destitute sinner you and I there was nothing else to suffer he had suffered it all through the redemption that word redemption is loaded with meaning Christ Jesus paid it all look to him look to him and be saved and you will not be disappointed if you would know the truth the truth will set you free if you would know salvation cry to him and he will answer your prayer and it will become your testimony as well and it will be a testimony that will live not only all the days of your life as you have fellowship with the Father and the Son it is such a joy for me to walk in fellowship with the Father and the Son each day and to be able to call the all holy God Abba Father it's like Papa God we get so intimate with the Father that we can call him Abba Father it's so wonderful may this be your testimony yes and now and forevermore and so that together we may say all praise glory worship and honor be to the Father in heaven